Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jeff Harrell, and I'll be the host and moderator of today's webinar, Leveraging Threat Intelligence and Security Monitoring. Before we begin, I'd like to cover some basics and logistics. Today's webinar will be approximately one hour, including question and answer segment for the Q&A. Please use the questions button at the top part of the Bright Talk interface to submit your question. We'll answer as many questions as time permits. If your question isn't answered, please feel free to email us your question to the email address at the end of the presentation. We'd also appreciate it if you'd provide a rating and any feedback you might have on the content of the webinar, which you can do by clicking the ratings button. If you think this webinar will be of interest to your colleagues, please use the share this button to invite them to view the recorded version, which will be available within a few minutes after the conclusion of this webinar. I'm here today with Mike Rothman of Securosis, uh, who's gonna give you a, an unbiased view from his point of view, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about Norse and our technology towards the end. So now I'd like to turn it over to Mike. Uh, Mike, you want to introduce yourself? No. No, can't do that. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, it's great to be here. One of the things Jeff didn't mention about the ratings is that, you know, we're, we're interested in five-star ratings. So, um, you know, it's like, it's like buying a car, right? You know, they, they're, they only need the five-star ratings, and, and J.D. Powers is J.D. Powers will uh, rate this. So uh, aside from my uh, sophomoric humor, it is great to uh, to be here uh, today, really talk about threat intel, talk about security monitoring, which is certainly two of the uh, things that uh, I spend a lot of time uh, talking to folks about. I spend a lot of time researching, really understanding what's working, what's not working, uh, and I am uh, excited to share a lot of what I've been figuring out uh, and, and really kind of explaining a lot of the things that we documented uh, in a research paper that we published uh, earlier this year, amazingly enough, called Leveraging Threat Intelligence in Security Monitoring. Uh, so I know you can get that from, from our pals at Norse. Uh, so uh, at the end of uh, the presentation, I'll refer to it a number of times because obviously in, in, in a 25-35 in a minute uh, presentation, I can't get into the depth that we can in a much larger uh, type of form factor like a paper. So I will allude to a number of things uh, that are really explained in great detail uh, in the paper. Uh, so as we jump into it, let me first tell you a little bit about who I am and what I do. Uh, as uh, Jeff introduced me, I represent a small research boutique uh, called Securosis. Uh, we focus specifically on information security. That's all we do. It's our passion. It's what uh, we've been doing for many years. All of us are 20 plus year guys uh, in, in the technology and the security industry. Uh, we have uh, heads full of gray hair uh, and uh, have earned a lot of uh, the road rash that, that we carry uh, with us. Uh, we really focus on, on being pragmatic, right? So it's not about, hey, you know, you can do a million things or this vendor saying that or that vendor saying this. It's really about this is, you know, based upon what folks are really doing. This is what works and this is what we think is, is the best uh, path for, for folks to take. Uh, and me personally, uh, as I mentioned, you know, I've been in this space for, for 20 plus years, started out as a programmer, uh, ended up, you know, kind of getting into networks uh, early on before, you know, kind of IP was everywhere and, and, and this whole Ethernet thing when there's still a question uh, about what technologies were, were going to win. Uh, I was uh, in, in the space uh, doing networking stuff and then, you know, just because I, I, I was around, uh, I ended up starting to uh, to learn about network security uh, and that was probably, you know, close to 20 years ago uh, and I've been doing this uh, ever since. Uh, so it really is something that, that I do enjoy every time I try to get out of the security business, I get uh, pulled back in. Uh, uh, but that's okay because I love it. So let's start. You know, we do like to start uh, most of our presentations with uh, uh, a little excursion to the Meme Generator, uh, which is uh, one of my favorite websites uh, out there. And this one, you, you know, I, I just really love, right? Advanced attackers and, you know, you have your pimply-faced uh, orange belt, you know, telling, telling them to bring it, right? You know, we really want to see what you guys have. Because uh, I, I thought this was actually a very interesting contrast to how we usually view the attackers, right? You know, in most cases, we view the attackers as the pimply-faced 
orange belt uh, sitting in, in his parents' basement, uh, you know, kind of uh, attacking things, right? And we're the good guys, and, and we have a leg up on uh, these folks. But, you know, I think this is much more apropos to where we are as, as a practice, where we are as an industry, relative to defending uh, against advanced attacks. Uh, so, you know, again, we want we, – we sit there and, and say, you know, we want the attackers to bring it, but what we have to be is very cognizant of the fact that, you know, a lot of these adversaries nowadays kind of know what they're doing, right? You know, the attacks are, are, are better than the defenses. That's the first point. You know, advanced attackers, you know, they have more resources. They have more time. They understand what their mission is. Uh, they can go after, you know, specific people in your environment. They can take advantage uh, of, of holes that you haven't necessarily had the time, the resources, the expertise, or the funding to actually address, right? So, so it's one of these things where you kind of have to go into it, and that's why we favor security monitoring as a philosophy is something that is very, very important uh, from the standpoint of, of what it is that, that you do to ensure that you know what's happening, that you have some awareness of what's going on in your environment. But we'll get into what we mean by monitoring uh, as we move forward. For, for the purposes of where we are right now, we got to understand that we're not going to be able to stop all of the attacks that are coming towards us, right? 100% security has never been realistic. Nowadays, it's even less realistic. So we've got to grapple with that. Yet, what can we do? We can look for attacks, right? We can look for things that we know are bad, and there's a lot of different ways that we can figure out how things are bad, but that's really where threat intelligence comes into the uh, the mix, and we'll explain exactly what we mean by that uh, as well. But the fact of the matter is there are a couple things that are coming together to make most organizations much more effective in terms of understanding what it is that they're going to be targeted by, who it is that they're going to be targeted uh, from, uh, and ultimately, you know, what tactics those adversaries are going to use uh, against us. And then if we've got the right kind of data in place, then we'll be in a position to deal with it. But let's not get the cart before the horse, proverbially, uh, and let's kind of go back into remedial advanced attacker school, right, and, and talk a little bit about the kill chain. So this is something that, that Mike Cloppert of... Uh, General Dynamics came up with a couple of years ago. Um, you know, it, it, it just makes a lot of sense. It, it, it's a very easy metaphor to understand for how the attacks have really evolved over time. So what, what he mapped out was really a six-stage process, starting with recon, which is basically just figuring out what is happening in your environment, you, you know, coming up with some kind of exploit based upon their recon uh, to, you know, weaponize in a way that will allow you to get to the next place, which is to deliver the, uh, the attack to the target. Right, so again, they're doing recon to figure out where the weak spots are. They're building a weapon to take advantage of those weak spots. They're delivering the weapon to uh, wherever it needs to be delivered, and then they're exploiting the device. Right, so that's where a lot of the interesting things start to happen. That's where you, they're taking over devices. Maybe they have remote access Trojan. Maybe you know there's some other mechanism of controlling the device. Maybe it's just taking random instructions uh, from the botnet, what have you, uh, but you've got an exploited device in your environment. Then you've got a C2, which is command and control. That means command and control, and that's basically how the botnet masters or the, the people who run the compromised device communicate with the compromised device within your environment, and then ultimately you have exfiltration, right? If we break any of those links, right, if you can stop recon, which you really can't, you, you know, then you can break the kill chain. If you can, you know, make sure that the weapon doesn't get delivered to somebody that's going to be vulnerable to it, you can break the chain that way. You can catch the exploitation. You can detect and block the command and control traffic. Ultimately, you can stop the exfiltration as well. So you've got lots of opportunities to get in the mix and, and to intervene within the kill chain before you actually lose data. Uh, but most folks aren't very good at doing that, right? So that's why we have this problem. And by the way, we sit there and talk about this as being just kind of a linear specific type of attack. In many cases, there are multiple complexities uh, within this kind of kill chain, right? You know, there's all sorts of different ways to weaponize. There's all sorts of different ways to deliver. So it's not like, hey, I close one door. They'll come in through a window. They'll burrow underneath your house. They'll dig in through the sewers. So there's, again, there's lots of different ways for the adversaries to achieve their mission. We have to be aware and understand uh, the reality of, you know, kind of the fact that we're probably not going to be able to stop 
stop them reliably every single time, which forces us to, again, as we say here, right, look for those indicators, maybe even be a little bit more proactive and hunting, right? Hunting is a new term that uh, everybody likes to use of having people that are really out there trying to find the attackers preemptively and proactively uh, within your environment, looking for those indicators, uh, you, you know, kind of without kind of seeing the manifestations of the attack to go out and hunt for these folks. But regardless of what, what you want to do, uh, in, in effect, what you have to have is the set of security data to be able to figure out what's happening in your environment, right? You know, even if you know what you're looking for, if you're not collecting the data, you really won't be able to find it, right? So security monitoring isn't new. You know, we've been looking for attacks for years. I mean, we've had SIM, you know, or security event management, SIM, back in its first generation uh, for, what, 12 years? almost 15 years now, you know, first it was introduced to reduce the, the noise of our uh, intrusion detection devices and then firewalls and all sorts of other log and event sources. Uh, but now these tools have, have evolved uh, to provide, you know, pretty advanced correlation, uh, analytics, alerting, and basically allow you to, you know, really look for things that are attacks. Right? Look for things that look an awful lot like something that really shouldn't be happening within our environment. You know, it's pretty straightforward in terms of how you use these tools. You know, they'll come with, uh, I don't know, 70, 80, 100, 150 different rules out of the box that you can use to look for things like privilege escalation, look for things like, you know, compromise or malware uh, or, you know, kind of new accounts. Uh, lots of different ways that you could detect and attack, you know, different flows within your network uh, that, you know, kind of are uncharacteristic of what it is that you usually see uh, from that standpoint. Uh, but again, one of the fault, or I want to say fault, right, one of the features, because, you know, as an old software guy, what I can tell you is that if you can't fix something, uh, what you need to do is feature it. So one of the features of SIM is that, you know, if you really know what you're looking for, it does a pretty good job of finding it. But what happens when you don't know? what you're looking for, right? So if, you, if, if you're, you know, kind of not expecting, uh, you, you know, to, to see an alien group having a party, right? You, you, you know, again, that's probably something you're not expecting. It's hard, it's hard to sit there and say, oh, God, I got 150 rules in my sim. Uh, why don't we look for the aliens having a party rule, uh, right? You're probably not going to get to that level of, of, of rule. You've probably done, you know, probably a million other rules before you would get to the alien having a party uh, rule. So the reality is, you may stumble across an alien having a party, right, you know, in your environment. And you probably weren't looking for that, right? So so what, what you have to do, and, and obviously aliens having a party, you're going to create some mess, and, and, and they're going to create some problems uh, within your environment. So what you want to do is try to, wait for it, uh, benefit from the misfortune of others. And this is a concept that, that we kind of use to, you know, make it easy to understand what threat intel or threat intelligence can do for your environment. So I busted out the meme generator again. We got some, some office space action going on here, right? You know, you're telling me no one has ever seen this before. And, and that's really the concept behind benefiting from the misfortune of others. That's really the concept behind threat intelligence, which is the fact of the matter is, if you're not kind of the Department of Defense, you know, if you're not a Fortune 5 bank, if you're not one of the defense contractors, um, odds are somebody else is going to see an attack before you do, right? Odds are the adversaries are going to use their really fancy and special stuff against folks that actually have real security game. And not to say that you don't have real security game. If you're not one of those folks, you very well could have a world-class security program implemented and in place. Uh, but the likelihood is that you probably don't, right? The likelihood is if you're not one of those companies, you know, you invest what you need to on security, uh, and there's a reason for that because it doesn't help you sell stuff for the most part, right? It doesn't help you uh, kind of get more customers. It doesn't help you uh, kind of do your, your uh, job more efficiently. Uh, so for the most part, you're just trying to do as the bare minimum that you can uh, in order to, you know, get your job done, right? So what threat intelligence does is it learns – from some of those more forward or, you know, higher profile or more frequently attacked environments, you can learn from them and take those patterns, take those attacks, take those things that those guys have seen before and apply them to your environment. So it is kind of like looking into the future. It just happens to be your future. It, it's, it's a defense contractor's past, 
but it's your future. So hopefully that makes sense. But again, you, you, you know, somebody in many cases has seen the attack before, and therefore you should be able to look, know what you're looking for and then be able to really shorten the window of attack, right? So, so threat intelligence actually allows you to detect attacks, you know, earlier, because you know what to look for. You know what kind of the latest and greatest of these attack aspects are. You know what the indicators look like. You know what the bad uh, botnets uh, that are emerging, you know, kind of, you know those addresses. You know the kind of malware uh, that they're using. You know the tactics and, and the attack chain that they're using. And then you can start looking for that stuff within your environment, right? And, and even better, and the thing that I really like the most about this whole concept of threat intelligence is that it, it, it is inherently an information sharing type of situation. And security folks have always been very, very resistant. Again, I've been doing this for a long time, right? Security folks have always been very, very resistant to sharing information. Ooh, I don't want to tell them what I'm doing. Ooh, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, kind of put my cards out on the table in terms of, you, you know, how it is that uh, I protect myself. I don't want to do any of that. But because you can use, in many cases, third parties, because you can use information sharing and, and, and access centers uh, out there, ISACs, uh, that are out there many in, in your own industry, uh, in order to really leverage this information, it provides a much easier, much less uh, icky, right? That's a very scientific term, right? Less icky way to feel good about sharing some of the information so that it's not necessarily attributable directly back to you, but this third party is able to aggregate it again, whether it's your ISAC, whether it's a commercial third party threat intel shop, whatever it is, it allows you to shorten the window between when somebody gets attacked, when you get attacked, and when you know what you should be looking for within your security monitoring environment. So let's talk a little bit about the sources of threat intel that you can leverage, right? You know, so obviously there are compromised devices. Uh, if, if uh, you know, you have a device that looks an awful lot like something that is um, doing something bad within your environment like recon uh, or delivering exploits uh, to uh, your uh, other devices within your environment, that's usually probably an indication that uh, something bad's going on, right? Malware indicators, you can certainly get intel based upon, you, you know, what other organizations are being attacked with. So maybe that's a file base, maybe it's a set of indicators uh, of compromise relative to what the actual malware where it does as opposed to what it looks like because polymorphism uh, actually makes it hard to, you know, specifically nail down a specific uh, piece of malware. Uh, reputation, so it could be IP address reputation, could be file reputation, uh, just if you know it's bad, then you keep that score there. Uh, and ultimately, command and control networks as well. There's a lot of information out there about what the botnets are uh, that relates to IP reputation, but also the different patterns that they use, the domain generating algorithms that uh, they deploy in order to connect between the compromised device and the bot network. So lots of different places that you can get threat intel from, uh, lots of different ways that it can be delivered. Uh, I'm pretty sure Jeff's going to get into uh, a bunch of uh, these things in terms of, of where Norse uh, does and the breadth of the data that they have and how they can deliver it uh, into your environment. So I will defer that to my man Jeff for later on. Let's talk a little bit about the challenges before we jump into how your process actually has to work, which is really the uh, object of the uh, the paper that we wrote, right? So the challenges, obviously integrating the data. So, you know, you may have a monitoring environment, you know, you have a whole mess of threat intel, how do I make those things work together? So we'll talk a little bit about that later on, and I know Jeff will talk about that too. Uh, you've got to make sure that your rules and your alerts and your reports are updated accordingly, right? Remember, a SIM is wonderful, at finding things as long as you know what you're looking for, right? So now I've got this threat intel thing, and it's telling me what to look for. I've got to make sure that I'm updating, you know, kind of the rule base and, and the reports and the alerts so that they're reflecting the new information that I am getting. Uh, and preferably, you don't want to do that manually, right? If you have somebody who's just sitting there processing and tuning rules or changing rules within your sim, uh, that's really not going to scale, right? And then triage and validation, uh, that's still a challenge because, you, you know, again, there was this whole drive towards this concept of real time for a long time, right? You know, oh, we're real time. You know, oh, they're, they're, they're backward looking indicator. Oh, we do things in real time. Um, and then I would talk to a bunch of customers and I would say, hey guys, you, you, you know, there are these things and, and, and they can generate pseudo real time alerts, like, you know, within, you know, minutes, maybe sometimes even seconds. And they're like, yeah, don't care. 
what? You know, learning about something, getting an alert in seconds, you, you know, that, that, that isn't interesting to you? And they go, well, Mike, I'm, I'm resource constrained, right? I, I have people, and, and they've got a backlog of, you know, on a good day, a couple days, on a bad day, a couple weeks of things that we know are already bad, right, that have to get addressed. So you've still got to go through that process. Even if you fire the alerts faster, you still have to be properly resourced and have a process in place that allows you to actually triage and then validate that the attack has actually happened, that the device has been compromised, uh, or that uh, something is behaving badly in your environment. So again, don't want to poo-poo on these things. Uh, what I want to do is, is point out the challenge uh, that you'll have, because the, the closer and the shorter, you know, you make that window, right? And that's the whole objective of, of layering threat intel into a security monitoring program, which makes perfect sense. You know, you still have to have the resources in place to be able to do the work that kind of emanates out of the alert. So I will leave that at there, and then what we can do is kind of jump into the process. So you ready? Boom. Yes, it's a process. Yes, there are a lot of boxes in there. Yes, there are a lot of things that you need to do. Uh, yes, what I do suggest is that you do check out the threat intelligence and leveraging threat intelligence and security monitoring paper, because what we do is we actually – pick apart each one of these different boxes, right? And we, and we talk about kind of a network security monitoring process that we built a couple of years ago, and then we kind of talk about how we evolve it to become this, right, which involves gathering the threat intelligence and aggregating your security data, right? If, and, we'll, and we'll dig into each one of these, but at a high level, right? But if you're not aggregating your security data, if you're not gathering your threat intelligence, you know, those are really the, the, the base. That's the foundation of any kind of security monitoring uh, and, and analytics type of, of program that you have going on now. Then you get to the analytics stage where we want to analyze the data, leverage the threat intel, as we've been talking about, you know, prioritize my alerts. Uh, if I need to, get into deep forensic, and that really gets into, you know, deep collection really refers to a forensic type of uh, analysis uh, on a device or on a, you know, specific network uh, type of environment. Uh, and then we get to action, which is to validate and then ultimately to escalate the uh, incident, right? So again, if it really is an incident, if it's been validated based upon the alert that I'm getting, maybe driven out of threat intel, verified and substantiated with the aggregated security data that I have, at some point I'll say, oh crap, I've got to hit, you know, kind of, or I've, I've got to pull the, uh, the flag, I've got to hit the red button, whatever, again, metaphor you want to use uh, for that. Uh, what it really does is it, you know, means it's got to go over to my incident response team at that point, which, by the way, depending on the size of your company, may be you, uh, so the escalation wouldn't be that hard. Uh, but the fact is there are a lot of packaging and a lot of things that you need to do uh, in order to do incident response. And, and one of the more recent research projects that I've done actually dealt exactly with this, uh, which is uh, how to do incident response with threat intel. So let's talk about threat intel. So again, we've got uh, all this stuff enumerated within the paper, but what we want to do is start by profiling the adversary. Who are the folks that are more likely to try to attack me? Right, you know, that's what I need to know because then I'll be able to infer some of their tactics. I'll know what their target is. Maybe I'll be able to get a feel for their mission. Uh, then I'm going to gather samples uh, from some of these threat intel sources uh, that allow me to understand what it is that they're doing at a deeper level than, oh, a nation state may be after me. Well, great. What are they after? Okay, that's why I have to do my, my adversary analysis. And then once I understand what they're after, you know, what's the best way to get it and how have they done that in the past? Because, again, a lot of these folks can be profiled. A lot of these folks can be, um, in effect, modeled so you know what to look for. And that's not going to be 100% like anything else, right? They can change their tactics uh, at any time, but it at least gives you a little bit of a head start to understand what they're looking for. Then you're going to analyze all that data and in, in distill the intelligence that will come out of that. Now, again, this is a process that, you know, in, in a lot of cases, you know, you can do yourself, right? There's a lot of open source intel out there. There's a lot of different uh, areas where, where you can gather. Again, there are ISACs, which you can join, uh, which then will give you information. Depending on the nature of your business, you may be on a list with uh, the Department of Defense or the Department of Homeland Security uh, in the U.S., which would give you access to uh, some of that information. So again, lots of different places to get it, or you can go to a commercial provider, which is going to do a lot of this function. They're not necessarily going to profile the adversary for you, but they're certainly going to gather samples. They're going to analyze the data, and they're going to 
distill the indicators of things that you can look for. In terms of the security data that you're going to want to look for, again, there's a process here. Enumerate everything in your environment, and that gets into discovery, and that gets into, you know, really understanding where and what devices uh, are important within your environment. You know, get the scope. Uh, develop your policies for what it is that you're going to gather. Um, known patterns. So, you know, what we're going to do is we want to look for things that we know are attacks, right? And remember, I said at first, you know, one of the great powers of, of SIM technology and security monitoring technology is that it tells you what you know to look for. Uh, it, it does a great job of finding, you know, if you know what you're looking for. Uh, so those are the known patterns. You also want to deal with baselines. So there's a certain type of traffic that happens in your environment. You'd certainly want to take a baseline, not assuming that that's 100% kosher, because in many cases you'll already have adversaries uh, in your midst. You just may not know it. Uh, so, you know, we're not going to sit here and assume that that's the, the end-all, be-all, but it gives you a place to start and look for uh, different things that, that could be anomalous that could indicate attacks. Uh, then we've got data sources. Uh, again, lots of things that we can gather, logs, events, network packets, uh, endpoint telemetry, configuration, vulnerability, performance, you know, lots of different data sources that you can leverage uh, in order to build up that base that, again, gives you information to look for once you get into the analytics phase. Uh, the good news is, due to the power of Moore's Law, a lot of the very fancy math and computation that uh, is really required out of security analytics is not necessarily uh, requiring a Cray supercomputer, uh, as we see in the picture there, right? So we want to automate the threat intel integration, and that's key. I talked about that before. We're based on our environment. We talked about that. Analyze the data. Fire an alert based upon what we see. And again, maybe it's a pattern that we know what we're looking for. Maybe it's something that's driven out of the threat intel. Uh, and then, as I referred to as well, we're going to, for specific devices, go to a deep collection mechanism. And again, maybe that's just capturing all of the packets that go to and from that device. Maybe it's pulling very specific um, endpoint telemetry uh, off of that device. Maybe it's taking a forensic image of the device. But, you know, that deep collection gives us the basis for investigation, basis for prosecution uh, moving forward, uh, and really pumps into the incident management program. So that is analytics. And then finally, we've got to verify uh, the attack, right? Is it a compromised device or a false positive? Uh, and then if we would, were to go back to the process map, which uh, we can do really quickly there. What you see is this uh, arrow there from validate back up to intelligent collection, intelligence collection, which is really about evaluating and constantly tuning the intel that you use uh, in your environment. And that becomes very important because, again, you're making an investment in this, not only in what you're paying to get the intel, how much it costs you to integrate into your system, but also the cost of validation uh, and action there. So if you've got false positives, that costs you a lot of money. So you want to constantly be evaluating your intel to make sure that it's strong, right, to make sure that uh, you're getting the value out of it that you need. Um, because, uh, again, you want to constantly improve your ability to respond. You want to constantly tune uh, those thresholds within your security monitoring program. You want to constantly make sure that you're spending money and spending time on the things that will yield risk mitigation uh, in your environment, and that means you should be really evaluating everything that you do on an ongoing basis and constantly trying to refine that. So let's talk about, you know, how do we get started with this, right? And there's a whole section in the paper uh, on Quick Wins that goes through a very detailed scenario for how you can integrate threat intel into your existing security monitoring program and tune that process to really make it reflect and look like what we were talking about here, uh, right? But first we start with, again, looking for the low-hanging fruit, the stuff that we know is bad, and that's compromised devices. So, you, you know, maybe they're communicating with IP addresses that we know are malicious or part of a botnet, right? You know, maybe they're looking for those command and control channels through patterns that we know are indicative of callback traffic, right? Those are the things that, again, tend to be the easiest to find, right? So we can find those devices, then we know we have a problem, then we can kickstart our investigation to understand the breadth of the issue, you know, how much the malware and or adversary has proliferated within your environment and it gives you a real basis to start moving forward and fixing your environment. So that's really kind of the first thing that you should do is just find the devices that you know 
are owned within your environment and move forward to fix those. Then you can start looking for how these devices deviate from the baselines that you've set up, right? We talked about gathering baselines when we were gathering our uh, security data and then doing some of the analytics on it. Well, what we want to do is start looking for things that don't fit into those baselines. Somebody in finance shouldn't be into, you know, kind of the sales system uh, at any given time, right? Certainly not, you know, at mo most of the time. Or, you know, you don't want to see somebody on the shop floor, you know, mulling around the HR system and looking at payroll records, right? Those are internal indicators that something could be funky just based upon traffic patterns, right? You know, you may not want to see a big file transfer of five gig of data in the middle of the night, you know, to a place in Chechnya, right? Those things would deviate from your baseline, because that doesn't happen very often, right? So those are the things that you can start to look for that give you an idea that you may have a problem, right? That's another quick win. You know, it could be, again, the threat intel aspect of that. It could be the malware that you see uh, on some of these devices. It could be, you, you know, that would cause something to, to move from the baseline or, you know, cause drift from a configuration standpoint. All these things can be validated, verified, and triggered, you know, from the integration of threat intel into your environment. And then the adversary analysis helps to identify the patterns to watch for. So again, if you're in, a, in, in something that has very specialized intellectual property, well, odds are an adversary is going to be interested in that. Great. So how am I protecting that? What kind of attacks am I looking for? Who would be the adversary that would be most likely to be interested in that kind of thing? Perfect. Then I know what, you know, who that is. I know what tactics they tend to use. And then, of course, they'll change them, <laughs> right? But that's the cat and mouse game that we all play all the time. So that's what we have to be aware of from, from that standpoint. But again, there are a lot of different quick wins that you can get and that you can yield, again, from leveraging threat intel in your security monitoring environment. So how do we get sustainable value, right? Because these are, this is the, what we want to do, right? We don't just want to get, oh, hey, you know, we'll get the threat intel. It'll tell us what bad things happen, uh, and then, you know, we'll move on to the next shiny object uh, that shows up at, at the Black Hat Conference or, or at RSA uh, in April uh, next year, and you, you just got to have one of those, right? What we're trying to do is build a process and, and nurture and evolve a process so that it does provide sustainable value to our environment. So what we want to do is integrate the machine data, right? We want to integrate the threat intel in a way that I don't have to get involved or an admin doesn't have to get involved. So you're looking probably for a standard protocol. From an industry standpoint, it, it seems that, that sticks uh, and, and the, the, uh, the messaging protocol taxi uh, that originated out of MITRE uh, is gaining a lot of momentum out there in the market, so that's something that you want to pay attention to uh, from that standpoint. So what you want to do is make sure that it's integrated uh, in there and that you can, you know, again, leverage this over time. Uh, you want the rules and the alerts to be, again, automated and automatically configured. So if you see something from Threat Intel that's looking for a certain pattern, you don't want to have to manually enumerate that within your SIM, right? You just don't want to do that. So what, you're, what, what, what you want to be is, is in a situation where you're having that information pumped directly into uh, your uh, system, uh, and then you can look for that kind of stuff. And then ultimately, as I mentioned before, you want to be able to look and constantly gauge and, and assess the efficiency and the effectiveness of your threat intel. You want reports based upon the number of alerts that, you know, fired. X number were based upon threat intel. Y were actually, you know, kind of compromises. Uh, and Z told me exactly what I needed to do to, you know, work around uh, or remediate the issue. Those are the kind of things that you want to be able to report on within your environment to ensure that you're getting the proper value out of your investments. So to summarize, uh, adding value to existing security monitoring involves leveraging what's happening in other organizations that's benefiting from the misfortune of others. That's, you know, kind of the, the, the meme, you know, what do you mean? Nobody's ever seen this stuff before. Of course somebody's seen that stuff before, unless it's a true zero day and then you're owned, so then hopefully your incident response process uh, is up to snuff on that front because no amount of security monitoring is going to help you uh, in that case, right? Threat intel sources are in 
increasing in availability and maturing rapidly. Uh, so we're seeing a lot better information. We're seeing a lot more information. We're seeing better integration with a lot of the tools that you would use your security monitoring platforms. You're seeing a lot of um, continued innovation on the part of visualization and, and understanding where a lot of these attacks are coming from, which gets back to helping you with adversary analysis. Uh, so again, it's a pretty rapidly moving uh, market, and I know Jeff will be able to talk a, a lot about what uh, the trends that, uh, that Norse is seeing. Uh, and you want to be able to automatically integrate a lot of this threat intel into your rule sets to make your efforts more efficient uh, and effective. Uh, and again, automate, automate, automate. You'll hear the word automation a lot over the next couple of years uh, because it's important pretty much within every aspect of security. Uh, but what I would say is that there, there really isn't a lot more places where it's more important uh, than, you know, with, with this idea of leveraging threat intel uh, because, again, you just don't have the option. You don't have the resources. Your folks can't move fast enough to keep track of all the, uh, the new types of malware, all the new botnet uh, uh, networks and, and changes in, in those IP address spaces. I mean, these things are changing, you know, every couple minutes. Uh, so, you, you know, there's no way you can stay on top of that, you know, kind of as a human. So you have to automate uh, a lot of those things. So with that, I'll point you to a couple of things that uh, you can learn more uh, about the research that we're doing. There's our blog. Everything that we do uh, is, is posted to the blog first. Uh, so we like uh, our readers to, uh, you know, poke holes in our research and tell us uh, what we're doing wrong. Uh, here's a little link to our research library. So we've probably written 50-some-odd papers over the past uh, three, four years uh, on uh, a variety of different security topics. So you can check out the list and, and see all those papers, and, and we'll make a deal for you, right? Uh, we, again, post everything on our blog. Uh, all of our papers tend to be, you know, open, uh, no registration. Just download them, read them, get some value out of it. Uh, but what we do ask is that if you see stuff that doesn't reflect your experience or you want to learn more about something, uh, interact with us, send us a note, put a comment on a blog post, what have you. Help us make our research better because then we can be more effective for you. So here's how you get in touch with me. Uh, there's my email. Uh, I do get on the tweeter every so often. So uh, that is uh, a link uh, to that. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll be around for questions later on. Let me hand it over to Jeff. Hopefully I didn't consume too much of the time. Uh, and uh, take it away, my friend. Thanks, Mike. Great presentation as always. Um, I want to remind everybody, if you guys have any questions, please click on the questions button and, uh, and drop them in there for us so we can we can talk about them after uh, after I finish my few short slides. Um, uh, we'll put them in there either for myself uh, about Norse or or Mike. Um, we'll be happy to answer them. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, how Norse is different from some of the other threat intelligence companies that are out there. Um, we do what we call live attack intelligence. It's our you know kind of our own flavor of threat intelligence. Um, a little bit more proactive. We feel like. There's, uh, there's a lot of companies out there that, that um, will, will do research for your particular company, um, come up with a, a very large report based on um, what they see is happening to your, your organization, um, who they think is attacking, that sort of thing. That's not really what we do. We, um, uh, we're mostly focused on, uh, on automated threat intelligence. So the, all of our processes are automated around gathering and also in delivering, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that. Um, some of you may have may recognize our, our live map there. If you go to map.ipviking.com um, with your with your web browser, you can pull it up and see the the attacks in real time. And what you're looking at there is uh, we have a infrastructure all over the world that gathers um, threat intelligence, and the the map actually displays um, less than one percent of the data that we're seeing. So we see a, a whole lot of data every day that we're processing and. Uh, and, and then making actionable and delivering to our customers. So if you're checking out the map, uh, you can see a lot of the attacks in real time. So we have this infrastructure that we've, uh, we've built over the past 10 years. Um, it's all over the world in over 160 data centers, over 40 countries. We process over 130 terabytes of data a day. Uh, and, and you might be thinking, uh, you know, as Mike said, what can I do with all this data, right? Well, on, our, on the back end um, in the Norse cloud, uh, we call the dark matter platform. We actually process all of that information and give each of the, the IP addresses and URLs and, and things like that, uh, domains uh, that are doing bad things, we give them a score from zero to 100. Uh, and then that's what we deliver, that along with some, some very critical context to our customers so they can, uh, they can make better decisions. 
Uh, and we, are, we will talk a little bit about how we integrate that with the existing security solutions, which, is, um, which ties right into what Mike was talking about as well. So we, we, um, we have what we call organic dark intelligence. And uh, what we mean by that is it, organic meaning it's all ours. We, we grew it. We, we found it um, out there on the Internet. We're not aggregating open source feeds or anything like that. Uh, we're not taking data from our customers' networks. It's actually things, uh, indicators, um, bad IPs, bad URLs, bad domains that we've actually found out there in the wild, uh, a lot of times in the dark nets. Um, so we're, we're gathering as much as we can of that, and we're talking about um, all sorts of things. We're talking about uh, malware, botnets, uh, bogus IPs, uh, Tor exit nodes, other sorts of anonymous proxies. Basically, anything that's bad that's happening on the internet, we try to we try to gather as much information about it as we can. Um, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, but we're not gathering the data from from our customer networks like a lot of other vendors are. Um, that's certainly useful data, you know, especially if you've got a huge customer net, uh, network. Um, then it's really good to see what's going on in those networks. But we're actually looking, our microscopes are, our telescopes are pointed the other direction. We're looking at what's going on on the internet um, and, and especially in the dark net. So um, that's a, it's a little bit different perspective and, it, and it, of course it takes a lot more infrastructure to do that because we're looking all over um, the internet space. But we're trying to um, gather all of that and then distill it and deliver it to our customers. So let's talk a little bit about how it's delivered. We take that 130 terabytes plus per day of, of the intelligence that we're, we're gathering. We analyze it in the dark matter platform. Um, and one of the things that it would be good to, to kind of interject here, this is something that we really couldn't even be done, um, you know, maybe even five years ago. Um, before big data really came about and the ability to, to offload processing onto to graphics chips, um, that can that can do these things, these kind of processing a lot faster. It wasn't even possible. So, the, um, being able to, to analyze and, and process and deliver this much data this quickly is something that's just recently come about. So, um, I, I always find that part pretty interesting. So, we we take all this data, we analyze it within five seconds, we make it available to our customers. So that's within five seconds of us seeing something bad on the internet, um, we make that available to our customers um, through an API, and. We deliver it into two, three products, um, starting at the bottom there. Dark list is, is our, our kind of list of bad IPs, and it includes uh, the, the IPs, um, where they are in the world, uh, and, the, and a score. And that's um, the top three to five million worst IPs on the Internet. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about what people do with that in a moment. Um, Dark Viking is, uh, is more transactional, so you can integrate that in line with something like a login or a financial transaction. Um, where you basically send the IP to us and we respond with, uh, you know, here's what we've seen on it and um, here's the score. So you can you can decide whether to, you know, continue that financial transaction or, or block it or ask for more information or, or what have you. And then finally, Darkwatch is our new appliance. Um, we just came out with it uh, right before Black Hat. Um, it's designed to uh, protect people from in, in, inside a, a company's network from um, clicking on bad URLs, going to bad websites, and that sort of thing. So, um, uh, with Dark Viking, um, again, it's, it's uh, very transactional. Um, Dark Viking and Dark List are both uh, API capable, so you just you just integrate those into whatever you're using, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about the integrations on the next slide. Um, but Dark Viking has has just a, a ton of information about every IP we see, so up to um, up to five years of history on, on an IP, so we could see say. You know, we saw it was part of a botnet, and, and uh, you know, last year, um, in January of this year, we noticed that it was using a bogus IP, and, and now it's got malware on it. So that's a that's a, a critical context that shows you a history of, of badness on that particular IP address or, or URL. Um, Darklist is, is, like I said, it's a it's the list of of bad IPs, the three to five million worst IPs on the internet, um, and usually that's used to either either block. Um, on an edge device, or, or uh, you can put it into your SIM, um, so you can connect your internal security events with um, with things that we're seeing on the on the external internet. And then we just mentioned about um, Dark Watch, which is which is focused on uh, preventing things to, from getting into your network. So, um, very importantly, uh, Mike mentioned SIMs quite a bit. Um, that's probably the place where you see, aside from our appliance, that's where you see most of uh, most of our customers using our threat intelligence. 
they'll take um, Darklist and put it into their to, into their sim. So uh, a good example is let's say, and, and actually Mike alludes to this a little bit. If you um, if you see, you know, maybe a sales guy's laptop is um, sending a lot of data outside the network. You know, by itself, that that may not be a big thing, a big deal, right? It could just be him uploading his daughter's soccer game video um, to Dropbox or something like that. But with the threat intelligence that Norse provides, you can we'll be able to show you that hey, you know, that actually that data is going to uh, an IP in Romania, which is you know it's got a high score on it. So what we what we can do there is help you prioritize the things that you're seeing because everybody knows if you've got a sim, you've got tons and tons of alerts and and you've got lots of information. It's really hard to deal with it. So knowing that external context, that critical external context, can help you prioritize these um, the things that you're seeing so that you can really take action on the ones that are most important. Um, just our, our obligatory um, partner slide here, uh, we do have a lot of integrations with, with SIMS, um, next generation firewalls, even, um, even very fast network cards in the case of SolarFlare. So um, love to talk to you about this in more detail if you have any questions. Um, uh, but uh, for now, let's, um, let's just go on to the questions. Let's see what we got here. Uh, if we use, let's see, make sure, make sure I understand the question first. Um, oh, I the first one here is any specific Flash or Java requirements for that? I think if you're talking about the um, uh, the, the map, um, I I believe it's Flash. No, sorry, no, it's not Flash. HTML5. Yeah, it's HTML5. Sorry. Um, so no, you shouldn't need any any special requirements for that. It should just work. Um, Mike, well, let me throw this one over to you. What's the difference between cyber intelligence and threat intelligence, if anything, and does it matter? Mike, you still there? Sorry, I was on mute. I was trying to be kind to everybody, and yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm back, guys. I'm back. Um, yeah. So, so you, you know, the, the the point here, I think, is is you, you know, it's a delineation. I mean, if if I wanted to get you know, kind of very constructive, uh, you, you know, from 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 that standpoint, you, you know, cyber would be a little bit higher level, qualitative, you know, kind of information. Cyber, you know, something that would come out of uh, an alert that you would get, you know, kind of in a briefing report, you know, first thing in the morning, uh, where you, you know, kind of threat intel could be perceived to be something that's much more machine-like set of IPs, you know, malware indicators, you know, you know those kind of things. But, you, you know, the reality is a lot of it gets back to how you're going to use it. Uh, and some organizations, you know, just view it as a, a number of different types of intelligence sources uh, that then, you know, you figure out how you're going to use it, right? A lot of that so-called cyber intel uh, is going to be very useful from an adversary analysis standpoint, whereas what we could sit there and say is threat threat intel uh, would be very useful, again, for things that you're going to integrate directly into uh, your SIM or your monitoring platform. Yeah, exactly. Good good answer there. Um, so another question here, uh, just, I'll take this one. What factors do you use to score the threat of an IP? Um, actually, uh, we use over 1,500 different factors, but um, they kind of boil down into uh, to a few. Um, I'll just give some examples from um, the location of the IP in the world. Um, some places are just, you know, more prone to, to have malicious IPs than others. Um, what type of badness we're seeing, right? So um, a good example is a, a Tor exit node. By, you know, by itself, if you see an IP that's coming out of a Tor exit node, that's not going to give it a, a super high score. Um, but if you're a financial uh, institution, you really want to know about that because um, there's a very high uh, correlation of between fraud and the use of anonymous proxies um, for financial transactions. So, so it's more important to financial industries maybe than it would be to some others. Um, but that definitely would, uh, would, would um, have something to do with the score. Um, certainly if, you, if it's got malware on it as part of a botnet, that's going to give it a very high score as well. And, um, and you know, uh, coming from a bogus IP as well, that would, have, um, that would cause the score to go way up. Um, let's see. Couple more questions here. 
Um, one of the questions is, Darklist supported on open source software like Spam, Asa Spam Assassin, et cetera. Um, it, that's a, I should make sure to make a point that the, the APIs that we use are, are standard XML, JSON, so, um, so you can absolutely use it in, in pretty much whatever you want. In fact, uh, you can just use curl commands to use it to do it manually from a terminal window. Um, let's see. Uh, Mike, here's another one that, that um, you kind of touched on a little bit, but maybe you can talk about it in a little more detail. Um, what are your feelings about the standards like uh, Sticks and Taxi or Open IOCs? Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, that, that's actually a great one. Um, you, you know, the, the reality is I think a lot of it gets back to, you, you know, momentum, right? And, and, and standards, and, and obviously things can change, you know, here and there, but, but it does seem that, you know, sticks and taxi are starting to gain some momentum. Uh, you're starting to see a lot of tools that are out there, you know, really starting to use that, you know, descriptive language as, as a way to integrate uh, with uh, other tools. Um, you know, I mean, I've had people talk about, well, what about, you know, common event format or CEF, uh, and especially if you're dealing with uh, a bunch of the SIMs, you, you know, you hear about open IOC, you hear about, you, you know, kind of a, a lot of other, you know, Cybox, uh, which is actually a subset of or, or kind of the basis uh, for sticks. So, and again, there's, there's a lot uh, of different options out there. There's a whole bunch of pr proprietary integration, you know, formats that, that folks are using. Uh, but if I had to make a bet right now at this point in time, uh, I would say that, you know, sticks and taxi seem to be gathering uh, a sufficient amount of momentum uh, to think that, you, you know, that, that has a pretty good shot at, uh, at becoming, you, you know, at least one of the key standards. And again, you know, most of the tools that you're going to, you, you know, deal with are, are going to support, you know, at least multiple integration points. Uh, but, you know, you do want to push them towards uh, a single standard. And, and, and the thing about that that I do like about sticks uh, is that, yes, it's, it's, it's complex, um, but it is also very flexible, and it can map to almost any kind of, you know, information source and intelligence source uh, that ultimately, you know, kind of ends up emerging uh, out there. And, and, and that's what you want. You know, you, a lot of these proprietary integration capabilities, you know, require inhuman acts uh, when data formats change or when requirements evolve, uh, whereas, you know, just the nature of, of how Styx was designed uh, kind of insulates it a little bit from that. But, you know, obviously the, the, the penalty for that is some initial complexity up front. Uh, uh, but again, if I was a betting man, I would be betting on sticks and taxi. Yeah, and and we are. Um, you know, we've 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 been working pretty closely with the the guys who, uh, the guys at Mitre um, and at FSI SAC to get uh, to get our Avalanche server set up. Um, and uh, we're, we're not quite finished yet, but um, we are starting to test it. So as soon as uh, as soon as it's a requirement from a customer, we can pretty much turn it on. Um, so yeah, we we absolutely agree that there's got to be some sort of um, some sort of common common format uh, because there are certainly a lot of threat intelligence companies right now. Um, wh one uh, one more question: um, are, How are you integrating human intelligence into your threat information holdings? And if not, why not? Um, we actually are. Um, most of our the data that's available to our customers um, via the APIs right now is is um, virtually all of that is automated. Um, but we are starting to uh, to include some human intelligence in some of the reports we're doing. Um, we have a pretty big report coming out in a couple of months here, uh, so keep an eye out for that. That will include um, quite a bit of work from our human intelligence guys. Um, but as to you know why we're we're doing it kind of separately right now, um, again it's it's uh, it's about automation. Um, we're just able to gather and and uh, process and then deliver much more information much quicker. Uh, and then what we'll be doing in the future is just is kind of adding to that with our human intelligence side. Um, that looks like all the questions I think we can answer right now. Um, so, great. All right. Um, so, really, I really want to thank Mike uh, for joining us. Thanks, Mike. Um, great presentation as always. I, I want to thank everybody who listened in as well. If you have any more questions or you want further information, um, please visit our website. Uh, I mentioned earlier that it was uh, going to be an um, email at the end, and I forgot to put it in there. So, feel, feel free to email your questions to Jeff at norse-corp.com um, or Mike because he put his email address in there. Either way, um, and we'll be happy to, uh, to take care of you. Um, the recording for this webinar will probably be up in about five or ten minutes after this is over. So if you missed the beginning or you want to send it to somebody, um, please feel free to do that. 
So again, thanks everybody for your time and have a good day.